Hi, good evening. I'm Ann Kirshner. I'm the interim president of Hunter College, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all back. Second semester, this is the first event uh, for, the, for the spring for us here at Roosevelt House. Um, we're particularly honored tonight to have our chancellor, fellow Matos Rodriguez, who a couple of days ago announced an astonishing $75 million gift, the biggest ever to CUNY, um, to um, bring us uh, fully into the emerging world of artificial intelligence. That's so are you the, the real phalo or the AI phalo? Okay, it's the real, it's the real phalo. Um, and congratulations on that transformative gift. Um, you're gonna have a fantastic discussion tonight. Um, we're extremely grateful that we're gonna be joined by the amazing educator, um, Professor Joe Vitteridi, who has inspired us to organize this program. Um, and has agreed to serve as our moderator. Um, Dr. Vitteridi is the Thomas Hunter Professor of Public Policy at Hunter and the former chairman of the Department of Urban Policy and Planning. His most recent book is The Pragmatist, Bill de Blasio's Quest to Save the Soul of New York. Did he save it? Well, excuse me, I didn't ask you. I asked Professor Vitteridi. <laughs> Did he save it? Uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting a shrug. I would say that's a no. Um, he's also produced several studies of the mayoralty and urban education policy, including when mayors take charge, school governance in the city. So we really couldn't have a, a better moderator. He's gonna be in dialogue with this evening's featured author, Cara Fitzpatrick. Cara is a story editor at Chalkbeat, the nonprofit news organization dedicated to improving public education. In 2016, she won the George Polk Award as well as the Pulitzer as a Pulitzer Prize in local reporting for a series about school segregation. She was also a fellow at the Columbia School of Journalism. Um, no pressure or school rivalry at all, um, but Kara is a graduate of the University of Washington. She's gonna be in conversation with a man who not only graduated from Hunter College, this is the 55th anniversary year of his bachelor's degree, Hunter class 1969. And he's also a member of the Hunter College Hall of Fame. Um, so I was walking over here, um, and contemplating this title, The Death of the Public Schools, um, and thinking about the role of public education in my own life. I'm a graduate of the New York City Public Schools. I went to, um, to uh, public colleges. Um, and uh, maybe because this week is Holocaust Memorial Week, uh, my mother was particularly in my mind. She came to the United States uh, as a Holocaust survivor from Poland, and she spoke Polish and Yiddish and Czech and a little bit of, of Russian, no English. Um, but she learned English. She learned English when I went to school, and that was, to me, a, a revelation about public education, which is not only about educating our students, it's about educating families. Um, so. Um, so I think this is an extremely timely and important discussion for us to have. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight, um, and now I'm going to pass the mic over to our distinguished head of Roosevelt House, Harold Holzer. Thank you, Anne, and um, let me add my welcome to you for this first program of the spring. And I, I was thinking when um, President Kirshner talked about how her, her um, mother learned English because of the public schools. Tomorrow we launch our annual Grove program for selected students from Hunter and leaders in um, the political and government and business world who, who take them under their wings and uh, give them projects. It's a great experience for the students. And it's because of the benefaction of uh, uh, Eva Caston Grove who came to the United States from South America via the Holocaust and enrolled in Hunter with almost no English. And how did she learn English? She hung out at Roosevelt House <laughs> to listen to young women just jabbering and absorbing English that way and in the end gave Hunter College a $9 million gift. So um, those are the great stories. Um, so thank you again for coming and also thanks to the Chancellor. I have a more prosaic reason to thank him. I want to just thank 
CUNY and the Chancellor for helping us do some intercession, remediation, and rehabilitation of Roosevelt House, thanks to CUNY. Um, you will see beautiful new floors upstairs that we work very hard to refinish. So hold on to your wine. No spillage allowed from this point forward. And uh, we're very happy to have you. Just a bit of background um, about what these floors and these walls have heard. Because I always talk a little bit about the Franklin and Eleanor legacy vis-a-vis -vis the topic we're discussing. And here we know the, the Brain Trust met during the presidential transition upstairs in FDO's library and conceived the idea of the most massive public works projects in American history, including the construction of 38 new schools just in the five boroughs of New York City during the New Deal. Um, that was the birth of schools. Tonight we're facing a more dire topic and uh, a more dire challenge, clearly important to us at Hunter because the public schools are the feeders of the city university colleges. And um, we are crucially concerned with their health. And if the health is fading, we're concerned with that too. So we're grateful that Kara has written this book and grateful that Joe brought it to our attention. Remember, we will have a conversation and then uh, a question and answer period where you'll be invited to participate. Wait for the microphones because we, we are recording our program, broadcasting it on Zoom and recording it. And um, after that, please join us upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room for a reception and a book signing. And with that, Cara Fitzgerald and Joe Vitteridi. Good evening. Um, my voice has decided it's going to try to fail me tonight, so I'm, I hope it won't. <laughs> but I'm, I think we'll get through it. Um, let me also join uh, Harold and uh, President Kirshner in welcoming you to Roosevelt House. Uh, and congratulating you on a new, new book. This is the book. It will be available upstairs, and so um, you will have an opportunity to read it yourself if you haven't already. Um, we have about 40 minutes for our conversation, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&As from the audience. And if people keep their questions short, we'll get to hear a lot of questions. So. Um, uh, My answers may not be, however. <laughs> Yours don't have to be. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, I always like to start with a book. I always like to, uh, when I'm speaking to someone who has written a new book, my first question is why? Uh, what motivated you to write this particular book at this time? I didn't know better. I mean, it's, uh, it was a really, really difficult process. Um, no, I'd, I'd been a reporter in Florida, um, which has had school choice for a long time, so charter schools and school vouchers, tax credit scholarships. Um, I had written about segregation for about five years, and it was not related to school choice, but it came up in the sense that we were writing about, um, in particular, these schools that had been resegregated um, and had somewhat devastating conditions, extremely huge teacher turnover, um, violence in some cases, extremely low performing and also under-resourced. And um, as part of that process, we, and I say with myself and a couple other reporters, um, we interviewed a lot of families about the conditions in the schools and it kept coming up that families were trying to leave these schools. And because it was Florida, they had more options than you might in other places. So some of them would move to a different traditional public school or a magnet school or a charter school. Um, and some of them went to private schools with uh, essentially a voucher. And it was just in the back of my mind as sort of an interesting thing that didn't factor into the series at all. Um, but I wondered a little bit about where school choice came from, if it was a, a, you know, a systemic reform, if it was just something that might help individual children. Um, and, and so I ended up kind of taking those questions and uh, as part of a fellowship, developing it into a book. I did not think it would take me six years. So that's a key, key point there. Um, I have to ask you about the title. It's a bit ominous. Um, the death of public schools. Um, and 
some of your some of the uh, reviewers have challenged you on that. Um, right now, about eighty percent, eighty-five percent of American school children attend public schools. Um, some people would think it's a bit of an alarmist title, um, maybe somewhat hyperbolic. Um, what's your response to that? Well, the, the dark clouds really help with that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been kind of interesting because I think uh, I've, for a very polarizing subject, I've found some common ground in that conservatives are happy to win in the subtitle. Uh, but don't want to say that it will have any negative effect on public school. And then liberals tend to send me messages saying it's not over yet, it's not past tense. Um, and so so I've, I've found some common ground in people being mad about the title. Um, I meant the death of public school to be a little bit more philosophical because I say in the introduction that most American kids are still going to public schools, including charters. That's how we get at that number, if you include charter schools. What I was kind of getting at was the idea of what is a public school, because for more than 100 years, we've said that it is tuition-free, that it's secular, and in theory, at least, that it's open to everyone. And what conservatives have really successfully pushed is this idea that public education is any education being paid for with tax dollars, so religious schools, homeschooling in some cases, um, of course charter schools. And so what I was kind of getting at is, if anything that we pay for with public dollars is public, then at what point does, say, a Catholic school where all of the kids are using vouchers become a public school? And what does that mean then, you know, in terms of accountability, in terms of regulations? What, what are we owed as citizens if that is now a public school, what kind of information. So it's a little wonkier than uh, my So what are your thoughts reviewers. about that? Um, so, I mean, there's been some major changes just in the last two years. Yeah. Um, you know, you've traced the history of school choice. Uh, one of the most recent phenomenon we've, we've observed is what we call education savings accounts. Mm -hmm. And since uh, 2020, uh, 15 states have enacted choice laws, 36 states have broadened existing laws, but now we have 10 states with universal choice or what they call education savings accounts. Uh, could you say a little bit about them, what they are, and what your thoughts are about them? Well, so education savings accounts are basically where you take your kid out of public school, or maybe you never had them enrolled to begin with, and you get a, a certain amount of money from the state, and it varies a little bit, um, and you can use that money for different educational options. So maybe you pay for tuition at a private school. Um, in some places, you can pay for homeschooling expenses. Um, you can pay for maybe physical therapy. Um, it, it's basically the most flexible type of voucher, if you want to call it that, um, that we have now. And I, I went to Florida on a, uh, for a book event a couple months ago, and I toured what's called a micro school. And the definition of that varies a little bit, but the idea is sort of like a homeschooling co-op, or in this case, it was 80% um, of the families were homeschool families, and they would go to this micro school and basically buy classes a couple of times a week for their kids. So if I don't want to teach geometry to my homeschooled child, maybe I pay for it at this micro school twice a week or, or whatever it is. And, and in Florida, if you, um, not to get super into the weeds here, but if you get what's called a PEP plan, you can use public dollars to pay for that. And, and so that's, you know, the most flexible option is that education savings account. And it's kind of where the school choice movement has been pushing and also for universal, that every child qualifies regardless of need. Is that a problem? So I don't take a position on whether or not school choice is good or bad, because I am a journalist. The thing that I sort of take a position on is, you know, that the, the current rhetoric, the, the, there's been a shift in how people are arguing for school choice. And it used to be kind of this conversation about um, choice for 
maybe the most vulnerable children, for low-income children, for students with disabilities, and it was referred to often as a civil rights issue. And the last couple of years, the, the rhetoric has really shifted to, you know, we need to attack public education in order to win on choice. And that is what I think is, is concerning. I mean, you can set up school choice programs in a variety of ways to try to decide how you want to have them be accountable or be less accountable, and they vary quite a bit. Um, but the thing that I find concerning more than the existence of the programs is this idea that in order to win on them, to have more of them, to have this expansion, that we need to rip apart the public schools. Um, why, would that, why would that necessarily be the case? What do you mean? Ripping apart the public schools to have choice. Well, I mean in terms of public perception. Okay. And that's been sort of a stated... Um, strategy by some school choice supporters in the last couple of years? Well, um, some people look at education savings accounts and are concerned that um, there's a wide range of things people can do with them. Mm -hmm. They can get private tutoring, they can go to a private school. Some people say they can go to Disneyland and say it was an instructional trip. That's Florida. Trip. Well, yeah, that's Florida. That's true. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm we'll not dissing Florida. Um, that's but, literally what you can do in Florida. But, but the real issue, uh, what I'm hearing from people who are critical, and, and including some conservatives, by the way, mm -hmm. um, is the is the lack of accountability and monitoring. Is that a problem? Don't, don't you think that well, might be a problem? Well, as a journalist, I'm a big fan of accountability and data and public information. You know, if I can look at the test scores for a traditional public school or a charter school and get a sense of how, I mean, test scores are imperfect, but get a sense of how a school is doing. If I can go to a board meeting and if I can get information about who works at a school, as a journalist, I think that's all useful and I think it's useful to the public. Um, it's a lot harder to discern whether or not someone is doing well being homeschooled by their parents with the aid of some public money um, in some of those places where we've had these a little longer, there has been some fraud where people are spending it not on, say, curriculum for their kids, but on other things that are not educational. Um, in Florida, there is actually a debate right now where some, some Republicans are saying, you know, we need to, to maybe re-examine some of the things that we've said it's okay to use this money for because the Disney tickets is not actually a joke. That's an allowable expense if you have money left over in your education savings account. You can buy paddle boards, you can get Disney tickets. I think TVs was another one. And, and some Republicans are saying, you know, maybe we need to rethink that. Well, it's kind of ironic. Um, this is associated with conservatives, but there doesn't seem to be a real hold on how the money is spent. And so, um, it's not conservative, certainly in the way money is money, money could be spent. Yeah, it's an interesting aspect of this because it's not small government. And it's, I mean, I think to some extent there's an argument that if the amount of a voucher or the amount of an ESA is less than the amount we might spend on that child in a public school, then maybe that could be a savings. But Arizona is having a debate right now because they opened this up to everyone in the state, their ESA program, and they have a lot of kids who are already in private school who are now getting it paid for. So they've absorbed a cost that before families were paying, and it's causing some budget problems there. Um, at least from the title of the book, um, the theme sort of suggests that what's happening is is not a good thing, the death mm -hmm. of public schools. And so there's a subtle message here, if not a direct message, about what might be happening and how what's at risk. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a closer look at this. Um, uh, in 2022, the NAEP scores came out. National Assessment edu Educational Process um, Progress, which is considered the nation's report card. Mm -hmm. And it found that um, looking at students in the reading and math in the fourth and eighth grade, um, there were declines 
in reading and math for all, both grades. Uh, the dip in math was the largest ever. Uh, no state with a large urban system improved. Um, if we look at the results of recent uh, uh, testing that have come out, the program for international student assessment, uh, the U.S. came out um, 26 out of 81 countries in math. Uh, that's not a very impressive performance for a country that one sees itself as, an, as, a, as a global leader. Um, might we say that uh, you know, some change might be in order? And um, what's the difference between meaningful change and what you call the death of public schools? Well, are these pandemic numbers? I didn't catch the year that you said. They're pandemic test scores. No, but the pandemic wasn't just didn't happen just in the U.S. The pandemic happened globally. Well, sure, so we're but twenty six out of eighty one. That's not too good. But our test scores vary a little bit based on how long you had schools closed. Mm -hmm. You know, if you close schools, so you know. I mean, I think it's a little bit hard to use pandemic scores with everything that kids and families went through. <laughs> <clears throat> to make much of an argument that we should eradicate this system. I mean... Well, I'm not suggesting that. Well, let's hope not. But, no. um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a little bit hard to say that test scores are the reason that we should, we should change everything, which is, you know, a little bit the, uh, the argument right now from conservatives, you know, we're, we're referring now to public schools as government indoctrination camps and things, and that's that's a kind of wild rhetoric in itself. But I mean, I think if um, if you asked teachers what might help kids right now, it's it's probably things like class sizes or resources. You know, it's tutoring, it's mental health. You know, there's there's um, a lot of kids that are just struggling right now in the wake of not being in school and in the isolation and in losing caregivers to COVID. So I don't, I don't know that choice is a solution to those things um, in any kind of systemic sense. Well, um, you uh, traced the history of school choice and you looked at it in three different contexts. The first, which opponents of choice like to grab onto is that uh, during the years of desegregation when the Supreme Court in 1954 said we need to desegregate our schools, a lot of the southern states created choice programs so that um, students could leave public schools and attend segregated private schools. And that's a terrible history and lots of people who are Post choice like to go back to that, but you know, let's face it, uh, segregation wasn't invented by choice. Segregation existed in public schools already, and by the way, they still it still does. Um, when uh, if if we look at some recent data that has come out, Erica Frankenberg is a scholar at. Penn State, and she just came out with a report saying that uh, as of seven, 2021, 75% of black and Hispanic children attend schools that are 75% children of color. Uh, she looked at also spending and cited data that some other people uh, had put together and found that uh, pre Students who, pre who attend predominantly minority schools receive about 2,200 less per capita than students who have uh, attended predominantly white schools. Um, here we are. This is the 70th anniversary of Brown v. Board of Education. And um, it's understandable 
that certain people might feel failed by the system. Um, you talk uh, a, a lot about the first two programs that were created in Milwaukee uh, in 1995, uh, the this, which represents the second round of choice, which was targeted at uh, mostly minority students who attended underperforming schools who were looking for alternatives. And I followed that very closely. Um, in fact, I gave expert testimony in the Supreme Court case that resulted from it. Um, by the time the voucher program in, uh, was created in 1995 in Milwaukee, uh, it was 19 years past when a federal judge ordered the schools to desegregate. And Milwaukee still, the schools still were not desegregated and they still were not performing very well. And I spent a lot of time talking to people like Howard Fuller, who are out there in the middle of this battle, who started an organization called the Black, uh, Black Organization for Educational Alternatives, Black Alliance for Educational Alternatives, who were deeply frustrated with this in looking for alternatives. Um, that's when the, the voucher program was, was, was created 19 years after that court mandate, which was a failure. Uh, in Cleveland, in 1995, when again, uh, there was a choice movement that was very much instigated by black activists, a woman by the name of Fannie Lewis, who was a local city council uh, person, who joined alliances with conservatives uh, who they would not usually be seen as bedfellows with, and said, we need, we need programs that will allow us to leave our schools and to find alternatives. Um, by that time, uh, in 1995, when it happened in Cleveland, um, a federal judge overseeing the segregation case said that the Cleveland school system was in such bad shape, it should be taken over by the state. So you, we need to understand the frustration on the part of black activists uh, in supporting choice and wanting alternatives to chronically failing public schools that their kids get stuck in. Um, and so now there's a third phase, which you talk about, in which we started the conversation about, of movement towards not targeted choice that was just meant to benefit uh, under-resourced kids and underserved kids, but universal choice. Um, so we're in the third phase. Um, don't you think we should be having a conversation not just about choice in general, but looking at it more carefully and saying, well, what is the what are we trying to accomplish here? Because you know, I speak to Howard all the time, and um, people like him and Jack Coons, who was one of, also the founder of this whole idea of targeted choice, just targeted at poor kids to give them some relief, uh, are very frustrated with the way things are going also. And I would include myself in that group. Um, don't you think we should be, rather than trying to look at the whole thing across the board, isn't it time to have a conversation about what do we mean by choice? What are the objectives? Who is going to benefit? What might be the advantage or disadvantage of having universal choice? I mean, one of the problems I feel with universal choice is if everyone has a voucher where they can go to any school they want, one of you, what, what it's going to give most choice to is uh, admissions advisors at private schools who are going to be able to pick and choose what students they get because there's going to be more of a demand for still a limited amount of space. And what happens to those kids who are seeking relief? Um, do we just forget it? Do we say choice fails? Do we say that, you know, it's time to do something else? Um, you know, I've met a lot of those parents, and it's very hard to walk away and say, 
you know, it's too bad, it didn't work, you know, maybe you ought to do something else. If you, you know, if you have a kid in school and we say, well, things are going to get better, it's 70 years past Brown. Um, and when you tell a parent whose kid is in a school that is obviously not performing well, uh, things are going to get better, you know, they don't have four or five years, or certainly don't, you know, to wait. And so, where should we be taking this conversation? Well, I mean, I think people have been having that conversation for a long time. Um, Howard Fuller that you mentioned, I saw him when I was in Milwaukee, and he's opposed to universal choice, has always been opposed to universal choice. He uh, was in it for low-income children, um, you know, particularly children of color. And, and that's part of the reason that Milwaukee had their program. It's one of the things that I think is sort of interesting about this history is that you have this constant subtext of race and segregation, you know, because you do have um, sort of the origin story that it's uh, segregationists came up with some different uh, school voucher programs trying to get around Brown versus Board. Um, and that is sort of the origin story that you'll hear from progressives, but it's, it's not the only one. You know, it's the same time period that segregationists were doing that. Um, you also had Milton Friedman, who was talking about school vouchers in an economic sense. He thought that public education uh, was a monopoly, and he thought that universal vouchers made more sense, and that you would see you know, sort of uh, an increase in different types of schools, an improvement of schools if you had it on a marketplace. Um, you know, and then at the same time that he was making that case and that segregationists were talking about this for very different reasons, you know, you had Virgil Bloom, who was a priest in Milwaukee, who was talking about it in the sense of religious liberty. He thought that uh, it was discrimination to ask religious families to pay taxes, you know, to support a public system and then also pay tuition. And that conversation is happening right now. And, and I think the, our current Supreme Court is uh, very sympathetic to that idea. Um, but I think, I think these conversations have been happening throughout the entire development of it. You know, I think that people like Howard Fuller had different intentions for it, um, you know, than, than people like Milton Friedman. And, and Jack Coons and Milton Friedman had arguments about who is this for and what does it look like if it's for everyone and what does it look like if it's for just students with disabilities or just low-income children. So I think those conversations have been happening um, throughout the history of it. I think one of the reasons that for some people the answer is just no is that, um, you know, when some of these things got started, some of the opponents said it's for low-income children now. It's for students with disabilities now. It's small now. It will grow. And that was their concern. At what point is it, you know, replacing the schools as opposed to maybe adding some competition or helping children who don't have a lot of options. Um, and that's what I think is sort of interesting about it, is uh, the, all of these conversations and debates that happen within the school choice movement, you know, where, I mean, Polly Williams, who helped create Milwaukee's program, was one of the black parents who was sort of fed up with integration policies that she thought put too much of the burden on black families. Um, and she didn't think it was creating the academic results that she was looking for. Um, you know, and I think, I think that is part of it. And then we still have a lot of those questions. And New York is a deeply segregated school system. I don't know that choice is an answer to that, but, um, but I think that that is part of the conversation when people are looking for other options. What about, um, you've studied this for six years, uh, what about choice for uh, the way it was originally conceived by some people, anyway? I don't, Milton Fried, Fried, you mentioned Milton Friedman. Um, Milton Friedman uh, had a very had a was more of a universal choice kind. I mean, he was a market economist, a Nobel Prize winner, who said, you know, if we let every parent choose, give every parent a voucher and let them choose the schools they want, the market will eliminate. The underperforming schools and close them down, and everybody will get a decent education, including minority kids that he expressed concern about. 
He also uh, thought it would take care of discrimination, which is interesting. Huh? Excuse me? He also thought it would take care of racial yeah. discrimination, yeah. which is sort of interesting. Yeah. But we, you know, the fact of the matter is we haven't take care we haven't taken care of it. Um, again, seven years after Brown, schools are still very segregated. We don't spend as much on kids who need it more. Um, and so it to me there's an obvious conversation that has to be had now as as the, as the as the movement moves off into a more more towards universal choice which i think may spend itself out anyway because it costs too much money for conservatives but that's a whole other thing um, but i mean do we throw you know as I, these are there are still a lot of poor kids who are looking for alternatives to chronic attendance at schools where they have no choice but to get an education that's not working. Um, and so um, do you, are you more receptive to that form of choice than you would be to a Milton Friedman universal uh, choice? Well, I think that argument is more compelling, and it's part of the reason that those programs happened in the first place, was that the idea was that we will give children who have the least ability to choose, you know, by moving or by paying tuition, um, greater choice. But what's interesting about it to me from a public policy standpoint is that now we're 30-some years into it, and the research is not sort of the, the the results are not kind of, I think, what advocates were hoping for. Um, there is some research showing that competition improves public schools, that they respond to it um, for charters and for school vouchers. That's interesting. Um, you know, one of those studies says that in a, in a community where you have 10% or more of schools that are charters, that academic metrics improve for everyone, in part because the traditional schools, some of the real low performers close. Um, that's kind of interesting, because you could also maybe improve those schools in a, in a different way. But we also now have several large studies that don't show that academic results improve a lot for the children who are using the vouchers. So, if the test scores are about the same or worse, which has been the case in some of these programs, I don't know if that's a really good argument for the school voucher programs. And, and it's a, a bit of a wrinkle to me if competition improves the system, but the most vulnerable kids' test scores are not improving. And again, test scores are not the end-all, be-all of education. There's also been some studies saying that some of their life outcomes for voucher students are a little better. Maybe you're more likely to graduate high school. So, but to me, I think that, you know, if you're talking about test scores for traditional public schools and we're not seeing wonderful gains in test scores for the students using the vouchers, I don't know if that makes a good case that that's the best thing to do for vulnerable students. Um, when the, well, let's look at the, Let's talk back to Milwaukee, and I'd like to talk about charters too, but let's stick with Milwaukee and Cleveland. Um, when they finally enacted uh, those two programs, there was lots of opposition, lots of effective opposition. So while they weren't able to stop the programs, they were able to make sure they weren't funded very well. So um, the average uh, in uh, in Milwaukee, the, the amount of money spent for each child in the so-called voucher program was twenty five hundred per capita. And the, when it started, you mean? Yeah. And the same that same year, the amount spent on kids in public schools was six thousand uh, dollars. If you go to Cleveland, the per capita spending for the kids in the what they call scholarships um, was twenty two hundred bucks. Uh, Cleveland was spending sixty one ninety five on general, you know, in their public schools. They also offered suburban 
public schools an opportunity to accept some of the choice kids. And they offered them $6,000 as opposed to the 2200 they offered for the uh, non-public schools. Um, none of the suburbs said, we're interested. <laughs> um, Jack Coons loves to say that um, public schools are public uh, only if you can afford to live in the expensive district and if you can afford the house and afford the taxes, then it's a public school. And he wrote a story about a, a, a Latino child who got caught registering for a school in the suburbs uh, that she didn't belong in and she got thrown out. <laughs> So his idea is, is that they're public only in a sense. But anyway, getting back to this, maybe uh, a good place to have the conversation is if we're going to try this, maybe we should really try it and invest the money. Um, it, it's, it's almost incredible that you would, you would create a program for kids that are having trouble academically, and you would spend less on them than you would for on the kids who are in the other programs, but we managed to do that. And so then when economists come by and say, well, we did the comparisons, that, you know, they're not doing as well as the other kids, they don't look at the costs. I mean, it's, is it, might that be a factor? Well, private schools run a little differently than public schools. Their teachers sometimes are paid less, yes, in fact, do. are often paid less. Some of the, you know, Catholic schools have often had good results, um, but for a long time they had much cheaper labor because they had, you know, nuns teaching, um, you know, so that's a factor. Private schools also are not obligated to take everyone, you know. Um, the public school system, maybe the individual school does not have to take everyone because they have admissions criteria or whatever it is, but the district does have to find a place for you, and they cannot, if my child has a disability, say, I'm sorry, we don't have services for you. They have to provide those services, and they cost a lot more um, in some cases than educating a, a child that maybe doesn't have some of those needs for therapy and different things. Um, so that makes it a little bit hard to compare. When they do these studies, what they usually try to do, you know, is to, to, to say, if you can, let's compare this child to another child that's, that's similar and then say, what happened to the child that stayed in public school and what happened to the child that took the voucher? And, and it's not a perfect way to, to study these, but, but that's what they try to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know that it even makes a ton of sense to talk about cost in that sense, because when you're in a public school, again, maybe my child needs a reading specialist for six months, but so do 30 other kids. You know, and so sometimes the cost is some of these things that are shared. And private schools don't always have those kinds of resources. So sometimes the private schools are working out very well for children that don't need all of these things. And, and they're not required to provide them. So, I mean, and also I've heard conservatives make the argument that vouchers are saving us money because it's less. So I don't, you know, I don't know if it makes sense to pour more money into it and think the outcomes might be better or not. I, I don't think spending less money on education is ever a good argument. But um, yeah, I, I would say, though, that if my, if my understanding it correctly, when the Milwaukee and Cleveland program started, they, wouldn't, they were not allowed to uh, reject any students that won. You know, they did it by lottery, and they accepted. Yeah, but. They had a lottery, but still a school can say, we can't serve you. That happens all the time. I don't think that, well, maybe we disagree on that. Um, let's, um, let's talk about charters. That's a different place. Uh, they're now in 46 states. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are they a good thing or are they a bad thing? What, I mean, uh, have they shown some positive results, is it good to have them around, or are they, are they endangering public schools, or are, are they, do you, would you consider them public schools? Well, by law, they're considered public schools. Um, 
But we're seeing that question being you know, asked in the courts right now because Oklahoma has approved right. um, potentially the first, the country's first religious charter school um, and you know, there's legal action over this. And part of the argument there is, is it really a public school or is it a, a private actor? And so legally that question is still sort of being hammered out. Um, but in every state where they exist, they are considered a form of public school. Um, I mean, they have kind of an interesting history because they arose around the same time that Milwaukee's program did uh, for school vouchers. And it was for a while sort of the Democratic answer to Republican support of school vouchers. And it was, we support choice too, but we support public choice with accountability. And the idea was that this is a different type of public school uh, that is sort of free from the bureaucracy of the school district, but then can innovate and can try different things. It can have a longer day or a longer school year. Um, and, and the idea was that maybe there would be things that a charter school might try that would be um, replicable for the traditional public schools, that maybe we might learn something that way. Um, and so it's an interesting concept, and it had bipartisan support for a long time. Um, just in the last few years, you know, there's been a backlash uh, where a lot of Democrats have soured on charters, I think in part because during the Trump administration, they didn't want to support anything that Trump or um, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos supported. So there's been kind of a souring there on the, the Democratic side. But um, charters are kind of interesting because they've had pretty good results in urban areas, um, you know, and, and often have been attended by low-income children of color. And so they've had pretty good results in urban areas, not so much in suburban, I think maybe less of a need in some cases. Um, but because the idea there was that they should be different, I think it's sort of hard to talk about them as a sector. Um, but people have tried to answer the question, just are charter schools on average across the country better than traditional public schools? And there was a study that came out over the summer that said that on average, charter schools had a little bit of a test score advantage over traditional public schools, uh, but it was very, very small. Um, that particular researcher uses days of learning. Um, so you, you might be talking about the difference of six days. Talking about Matthew Raymond? No, uh, Credo. Yeah. Well, that's yes, Matthew yeah, yeah, Raymond. yeah. That's, she has that up. Um, yeah, so that might be the difference between being in the 50th percentile for math or the 50.4. But I think when you're trying to, to talk about all charters versus all traditional public schools, it's a little bit hard anyways. Um, I think one of the questions about charters is that where they have become very popular, you do have this issue of declining enrollment sometimes for the traditional public schools and, and communities talking about closing schools. And so I think that's where some of the concern about them comes from, is at what point is, does this go from competition to just overtaking you know, the public system? And I, th I think that that is, uh, you could go either way on that. I think it's, it's interesting where you see a, some competition from charters improve the system by closing, you know, having other schools close. That's an interesting way to do it. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think people can disagree about them. Well, of course, parents would, most, that's mostly who we see in charter schools. If that's what they prefer and they think it's better for their kids, why is it a problem? Well, I think one of the things that people are concerned about with charters over time has been that a number of them close. And so you might have a charter school that opens with very good intentions and then it closes mid-year for whatever reason and then kids are sort of scrambling to find a placement and often they end up back in the traditional system. But there's a number of them that are very good schools and that people are you know, uh, on waiting lists for. Okay, I think there are people who want to ask questions, I believe. And so, um, uh, let's see. Um, we have about 10 minutes, and so if you promise not to make them long questions or, and make them questions and not speeches, although we never hear those in this, this room, um, lots of people will get to ask questions. So um, why don't we start? Um, let's, uh, let's start in the back. 
uh, gentlemen, and uh, we have somebody who uh, has a mic that will allow you to uh, be heard. So, all I'm asking you to do is to save the public schools, put some computers in them, and make sure they have four browsers: Opera, my favorite browser, Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox. So when they save pages between those browsers, they'll see the difference. That's it. Okay. I don't think that was a question. But uh, okay, so, yeah, so we I, don't have to answer it. <clears throat> I'd, like um, to, I'd like to ask a question about uh, school boards and the, the campaign on the right to take over school boards. They're not, they're not trying to kill, necessarily kill public schools. What's your take on Moms for Liberty? I mean, how serious a threat are these right-wing campaigns to elect school board members? Well, I mean, it depends a little bit, I think, on where you live, you know, obviously. When I was in uh, Florida, there's a great deal of concern about this, and there's been some successful attempts at running for office and then, uh, you know, being part of the school board. I don't necessarily think it's a problem for people to run for school board. I mean, I understand this idea of, of this is where some of the decisions are made, and so Republicans are pressing people to to run for those seats. But when I was a education reporter, it would be like me at a school board meeting and three other people. So in a sense, I think it's good that people are interested in what school boards do and that some of the result of that campaign has been people realizing that actually, you know, that, that these bodies make important decisions and maybe we should pay attention to that. Um, I do think there's, we're already seeing a bit of a backlash on some of this. Um, you know, some of the, the school board campaigns in the last election where uh, Moms for Liberty and various groups endorsed people, um, a, a lot of those folks who were endorsed lost. So I do think there's been a bit of a backlash, and also in part because parents generally are aware of what's going on in their schools. And so when you're, when you're campaigning on the idea that, that there's indoctrination and there's you know, activities happening, uh, that social emotional learning is somehow a, a liberal plot, if you're a parent, I feel like a lot of people are aware of what's going on, and so they can say, actually, I don't see that happening in my school. I don't think this is the big issue you're saying it is. I mean, social-emotional learning for my kids last year was like yoga. So to me, I was going, I don't know. So, and I think a lot of people have those reactions. So I, you know, I, think, I think we'll probably continue to see a bit of a backlash. But in general, I think if you want to run for school board, then people should do that. So, um, I have a question. Um, are the ESA? Um, oh, sorry. I, I'll, I'll let's give some people up front a chance to talk, ask a question. Okay. Oh, I have the microphone. <laughs> okay. Go are ahead. the ESA allocations um, uh, use uh, means testing as a criteria, or what other determinants are operative in making the allocations? Does means for, th testing? for the ESAs? Yes. It depends on where you live. Um, you know, the push right now is for, for universal, for every kid in the state to qualify. And there's um, nine or 10 states where that's the case. I think Indiana is still 99%, so it might actually be nine. But, um, but in, in some places, it's an ESA for students with disabilities, you know, or it's an ESA for students below a certain income threshold. It varies. Thank you. Uh, do you think school choice is making us a more secular, more polarized society? And is that a good thing? A more secular one? Secular and polarized. Is that school choices? I mean, one of the arguments that I hear conservatives makes for, for school choice is that it is an answer to the polarization uh, in the country, that if every family is making a choice that reflects their values, that we'll actually have less polarization, which is sort of an interesting uh, argument, um, but it's very much the opposite of what we want from, you know, and the design for public education. So, I mean, I think it has that potential if, um, 
if everyone gets public dollars to get exactly the kind of education that works only for their family, then one could expect that you are you are choosing things that don't in any way question your value. You know, I mean, it's just it's just a very different concept than public education, where we're saying let's bring everybody together with different ideas and sort of force them to interact, especially at a young age. So I, I don't know that it's. It's definitely not making us more secular. A lot of school choice programs are primarily going to religious schools just because that's a lot of the private schools that we have. Yes. Um, I used to live in Atlanta and in Georgia there was a program where the, there was a, like a voucher program and it really became sort of a de facto um, free tuition boost um, for some people. But if you're given, if there's a, a, a voucher of $2,500 or something that can follow a student, that's not gonna cover the full private school tuition. And so what happened is that a lot of the kids who didn't need extra money or, or um, scholarship to go to these private schools were getting essentially a scholarship to go to some of these private schools. Can you speak to is that common in other states, or is did you find much about that research I in your research? Well, there's there has been a bit of an issue of um, private schools reacting to the voucher in some cases by raising their own tuition because in a way, if you were if you were charging people, you know, eight thousand dollars, and now the voucher is eight thousand dollars. I think the original idea was that then these kids can go to the school. But in some cases, what we've seen are private schools then increasing the tuition above that. And so in a way, it's like a, a fundraiser for them. Um, and ProPublica actually just had a story out about that in Ohio, that happening in Ohio. But um, that happened a little bit in Florida, too. Um, but that is one thing where if you were concerned about it as someone designing the program, you could you know, on the front end, say we're not going to allow anyone to charge more than this amount. Um, the other concern has just been that a lot of these vouchers are not going to cover the cost of your sort of real high-end elite private schools. And so is the answer to increase the amount of the, the voucher? Is it to say that this really is covering sort of a, a less expensive school? Um, that issue is, has really come up throughout the entire history of it, of, of what are we trying to pay for and how much is enough. Great, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about how unions fit into the story? And I'll just, my, my real question is, is about, um, I sometimes see the conservative critique of public schools is because they're controlled by unions and unions vote Democrat. And so sometimes this is a way to get you know, back at your enemies, but I don't know if that, but I don't know if that speaks at all to the grassroots. So, if you could just talk a little bit about the role of unions, that'd be great. Well, teachers' unions have consistently opposed all of these things. They've opposed private school choice. They've opposed um, from in the beginning charter schools. In some cases, unions have actually opened their own charters, but but early on opposed it. Um, they've opposed open enrollment plans where you can cross, you know, district lines maybe. Um, and, and so they've been a consistent voice of opposition. Um, in some cases, I would say what, what the concern that, that they've raised is the idea of how big can this get. That, that thing that I mentioned earlier of it starts off small and it starts off targeted and then it gets larger. Um, but And I, I would say the only wrinkle to that opposition is that Albert Shanker um, you know, who was, who was a national labor uh, president, for a very, very brief period of time, thought charter schools might be a good idea, and then I mean, within a few years, changed his mind and sort of lumped them in with um, school vouchers as what he called gimmicks. But, but for the most part, that's always been, um, they've always been opposed. And I think there's some truth to the political aspect of it, you know, that teachers unions tend to be democratic. Um, and, and certainly on the right, there's a real effort to demonize teachers unions. Um, you know, I think Mike Pompeo was the one that called Randy Weingarten the most dangerous 
person in America or something. Some of the rhetoric is a little over the top. <laughs> I think we have one more, we have time for one more question. Thank you. I found this a most intriguing conversation, and I'm not a whole lot younger than you, uh, Dr. Vettoriti. I uh, am a product. I we won't argue about that. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I am an immigrant. My parents were Holocaust survivors. I went through the New York City public school system, but I find that the quality that was then is missing now, and I believe in quality. Last year I was involved with a think tank whose sole purpose was parents who can afford to send their kids to a specific private school, education-wise, that upholds the merits of Western civilization. That's the mission statement for the educational think tank and for the school it has begun to uh, create. And it's open to everyone, even though the majority of the students are Jewish. And if you, as a Catholic or Episcopalian or a Buddhist, don't mind taking an hour of Talmud or Bible study a day, you're more than welcome. And there has been an enormous response from non-Jewish parents to get their kids in. And everybody's welcome. So this is what's going on now in Jewish circles in New York City. You have a question. My question is, how do the public schools rank vis-a-vis -vis the private schools not just in New York City, but throughout the United States, whether they're just secular private or parochial private with a religious component? Who stacks up better? Well, it's kind of hard to, to know, actually, because we don't have the same accountability requirements for private schools. So if you attend a public school and you're required to take state tests, for instance, we might have an idea of how your school is doing compared to another public school. But the private schools aren't required to do those things um, for the most part. In some choice programs, they will have a requirement to test, and then you could maybe compare. But, but there's not really a good way to compare all private schools in the country to all public schools. I would say uh, quite often what you see with, with private schools um, is that you know, they, they are wealthier that affluent families are choosing private schools. And so I don't know that it would be a fair comparison if you could compare them. Um, please join me in thanking uh, uh, Karen Patrick for joining us tonight. Uh, there will be a book signing upstairs, and you'll have an opportunity to purchase the book and then read it. And you can argue about it even more. Um, OK.